Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks. Well, our next speaker is Stefan, who's going to talk to us about mobile money payments and virtual currencies. Great. Okay, so um, this is the first time that I really settle into any form of audience at all. So if I uh, look very, very under pressure when you ask me difficult questions, it's because this is, uh, we literally went into Alpha on Monday, so this is the first time I've been able to speak about what we're doing. I'm not actually going to talk about Settle, even though it's really exciting, um, because I, I think it's going to be more interesting if, if we talk about mobile money and virtual currencies in general. Um, so I'm going to speak about money, um, as a lot of other people have already, but I'm not going to talk about it in terms of how you invest it, or how you get it, or how you waste it, but in terms of what it is, and how I think it's going to change a lot uh, in the near future. Um, so some of you will think I'm from out of space and hope that you never see me again. Some of you will probably go, gosh, that's really interesting because wouldn't that be amazing? Um, and some of you might be in between. And uh, I'm interested to sort of read your faces. As I'm in the graveyard shift, I guess that energy is most important. So I'm going to kind of keep, keep it going and, and keep it quite quick so we have time for questions afterwards too. Um, OK, so without any further ado, the future of money in 15 minutes. Uh, have you ever tried to cash in on this particularly hollow promise uh, from the chief cashier of the Bank of England? Um, can you imagine if you had a trade dispute uh, with somebody with whom you'd exchanged cash um, and to try and resolve that dispute, you phoned up the chief cashier of the Bank of England and said, I've got a problem, I've used your, your currency, but, um, but the guy's provided me with a shit product, can you, can you help me manage that? And yet, the biggest mobile payment provider in the world, PayPal, has to do that on a daily basis. I'll tell you a story about one of PayPal's more ridiculous um, scenarios shortly, but, but unfortunately, that is the real world of, of mobile money. Um, the truth is that cash uh, is simply a promise, um, a fairly hollow promise. Uh, even the relationship between paper money and gold bullion seems to be down to the whimsical interests of different governments, not to mention the fact that the money that we generally deal with, the kind of $70 trillion that exists in the global financial system, is all fake, um, subject to uh, fiduciary and fiat variation, um, and also um, largely influenced by, again, government policy when they want to of easing, more of it appears when they don't, less of it appears. So, so the whole idea of money, I want you to first of all start by believing is totally made up. It's a confidence trick. And even, especially the hard notes in our pockets, these are complete confidence tricks. Um, so that's the first point. Uh, however, um, without these confidence tricks, life would be pretty tricky. Um, we'd be stuck in an age where we had to resort to bartering uh, or using chickens um, or notching little bits out of wooden sticks. So quite clearly having a kind of common um, myth in cash and money is very important for our, our daily lives, particularly those of us who make our money out of money. Um, however, we haven't really evolved that far from when we were using sticks of wood. And um, that's probably because money and the idea of trade um, is, is so very ingrained in our beings um, that actually it's something which, which we're born into and we, we live with as a species, as a social species. So to try and innovate in the nature of money is to kind of mess with human psychology at the very most fundamental level. So not an easy thing to achieve. Um, and just to illustrate this, no talk about human evolution would be complete without a reference to monkeys. But um, you'll be unsurprised to know that uh, capuchin monkeys, um, when presented with very basic transactional opportunities, very quickly learn not only how to barter coins for food, and they also learn how to prostitute themselves, how to prostitute other monkeys, um, and how to lend and collect on debts using very similar tactics to the more nefarious debt collection agencies that you may have heard of, I've certainly heard of uh, in my past experience as an entrepreneur. So, so money is part of our social makeup, um, and yet we haven't actually evolved that far from this position. Um, uh, and uh, you might notice this little nostalgic theme tune that I'm going to play to you. Even the most sophisticated credit card systems are, to money, what dial-up internet is to broadband. They haven't evolved at all. And we're stuck with very outdated systems to do really simple things. Shall I laugh now? Really simple things like debit card and credit card payments. They're still stuck in the, in the 1980s. Uh, so um, what, what are we going to do about this? And what opportunities are there to use technology to evolve money and evolve our thinking about money? Because quite a lot of people are sitting quite pretty with the way it is at the moment. Um, and as and, uh, that really pisses me off. So um, I'm going to do this because we're interested in disruption as well as in technology. So I, I really do apologize if, if you are into traditional banking, because um, you're probably going to hate me if this works. Um, so we're 
We, we said about six months ago thinking what sector are we going to disrupt and we thought we're going to disrupt the financial sector. That's ripe for disruption. Public sentiment seems to be on our side at the moment. What can we do to disrupt the financial center? Um, and we thought, well, the big thing that so far nobody really in traditional finance has managed to get right, um, even in retail propositions, um, is, is mobile. Um, and mobile is an integral part of life nowadays. 66% of people in the UK, according to the Daily Tory Graph, um, believe that, um, uh, or suffer from this thing called nomophobia, which is they actually experience um, psychosomatic symptoms when their phones are away from them, when they believe that they might be separated from their phones. A bit like if I chop my arm off, I might be a bit worried about what was going on. These people actually experience this in real life too. So, so mobile is a really big thing, and yet banks haven't really got their heads around this. And, and yet we're treating mobile as an extension of the self. So in terms of stuff like security and trust, mobile is a perfect place to generate something new and exciting in money. And what you may or may not know, um, and Barclays did a, a massive favor to us last week by spending millions of pounds on PR, uh, handling all the sorts of objections that we're gonna get from customers around security, adoption, that sort of stuff, when they launched Ping It in the UK, um, which is a deliberately sort of shit, closed shop system, brilliantly innovative if you're a bank, rubbish if you're a consumer, in, in my opinion, um, but, but it's the first step and there's lots of, lots of uh, ways it could go. But mobile money's already here. Um, in the UK, we've got Ping It, which is basically just mobile banking, but with the ability to send money based on mobile number rather than the account detail and sort code. Um, in the world, we have uh, PayPal, um, and uh, even in developing countries, in fact, in developing countries, they are way further ahead than us on this. In, uh, in places like Kenya, um, M-Pesa is more prolific than bank account exchanges, bank to bank exchanges, and it's money on your mobile that you send to people using, using text message. So, so in fact, there are big systems in the world um, using mobile to transfer and manage money. Um, that's, that's okay. Um, one of those reasons that m is so popular um, in, in places um, like, like developing countries is the lack of access to other banking alternatives, to bank accounts, to banks, to financial um, services that we take for granted. Um, so, so obviously innovation is, is very, very exciting there and, and making really big things happen. Um, however, um, it's only at the level of kind of basic small value transaction. And what we're talking about is not just wanting to send someone some money for a meal or texting someone a fiver to contribute towards a present. We're talking about the whole world of global finance and how mobile and internet is going to disrupt this in a massive, massive way in the next five years. If it's not me, it'll be somebody else. I, I promise you that. Because at the moment, all we're seeing is basic peer-to-peer -peer transactional stuff going on. But we are days, if not weeks, if not months, but possibly even only days away from seeing mobile payments being used to do real grown-up financial financial stuff. I'm talking about products, financial services, borrowing, lending, mortgaging, insuring, all in a very, very different way if someone can start to take ownership of the mobile money space and do something significant and prolific in it. And that's really what I want to finish off by talking about. I want to tell you who I think, or rather I want to offer some options to you of who I think is best positioned to really, um, really win in that mobile money space and in, in mobile finance. Um, and to do that, I'm going to just illustrate to you sort of uh, using a, a, a rather rubbish graphic because I'm not a graphic designer. Um, uh, I sort of prefer Excel spreadsheets to, 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 to um, pretty graphics. Um, but at the moment, if this is the global financial system and this is people, um, then the kind of people who've got a stake in mobile money are, are these guys here. Um, obviously, people like PayPal, who at the moment are doing about $600 million a year on their mobile apps. There are people, um, Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, um, very interested in near-field communication technology and the ability to store credit card details on a smartphone to make payments, that sort of stuff. They've got an interest in this space. Uh, obviously, banks. Barclays is a bank. Ping It is, I mean, to be fair to them, a, a beautifully designed product which genuinely does something new and different, which is great. But obviously, banks want to retain their position overall um, in being what most people go to when they do financial stuff. So if people are starting to use mobile, banks are going to want to be there to do it too. And then we have mobile networks. So M-Pesa um, has a heavy investment from Vodafone. It's actually mobile network dependent. This is the, uh, the Kenyan company. It's mobile network dependent for its operations because mobile companies power mobile phones and they want to monetize what goes on on those phones as well. So um, that's interesting. Any one of those people could be in the position to, to kind of win this thing. Um, however, uh, this is a slightly more representative chart of actually how much of the world's population 
um, these different institutions or sectors have existing relationships with. Uh, PayPal has fewer than 100 million active users worldwide. Uh, uh, Euro Europay, MasterCard and Visa have around 780 million issued credit and debit cards in the world and given that most people have more than one, um, they cater for a very, very small proportion of the global population. Um, banks even have fewer than 50% of the world's adult population on their books, all banks in the world. So more than half the people in the world um, don't have bank accounts at all at the moment of any description. Um, and uh, even, well, I say even, the mobile networks, however, have uh, more than three quarters of the global population on their books. More than three quarters of the people in the world have mobile. Way, way more than people who have internet connectivity. Certainly way, way more than people who have bank accounts. So in this whole global area is a big, big space to do something very, very different indeed. And um, what's really interesting about this is this space is typically where the tech startups, the tech entrepreneurs get excited because they haven't got the millions of dollars that banks have and they haven't got the, uh, the enormous um, weight and legislative power that Eurocard, MasterCard and Visa have. Um, they have innovation, they have gall, they have disruptive potential and in this case they have huge unaddressed market. And let me tell you why I think that independence might win this space. I'm going to tell you a couple of really, really simple quick stories. Um, the first um, is about a guy who makes a uh, product in North Africa, in Morocco. He's a, a producer, he makes um, little artifacts for gifts, and he sells them on Etsy. And my friend um, helped to get him set up on Etsy and actually helped to reversion the Etsy interface in a non-linguistic um, non way so that it was all image-based, so that he and his friends and villagers and other traders could use it. Now, he has to take a 30% hit on getting money in from his Western customers. So between someone in the States buying a product, bef before he even pays for the materials and the shipping, someone's taken on average around 30% all along the way. That's in credit card handling fees in the States, it's in uh, international forex charges on the way over, it's in local, a little bit of local corruption, but majority local fees in getting it back into his bank account again, and then maybe in some other fees to get it into his pocket in cash that he can use. That's hugely expensive. Hugely expensive. So the idea that the banks and the credit card companies are going to want to spread into this global marketplace and address the 50% of unaddressed people is unthinkable. They have massive revenue streams to protect and they are never going to do anything which undermines the 5% or 4% or 3% on credit cards or the massive amounts of money that get done and made in overnighting, uh, in foreign exchange and all this other stuff. So they're very, very b badly positioned for this. The other people who are badly positioned, ridiculously, even though they should be well positioned, are PayPal. Uh, PayPal recently destroyed an antique violin worth several thousand pounds, in fact tens of thousands of pounds. The reason they destroyed this violin is because they had to get involved in a dispute between a buyer and a seller. Because PayPal's legacy is in eBay and they've always had to service transactional disputes in the way that no government or chief cashier or even Visa or MasterCard has ever had to do. And what happened was the, the buyer said, um, I bought this violin um, and uh, it was said to be original. It looks original but it doesn't have the authentication certificate in it. Um, which doesn't prove its originality and PayPal contacted the vendor um, having received the goods back again because they're the little arbiters they couldn't contact the vendor so they were obliged to refund the buyer and destroy the item. So, so the, the, the reason I tell you this is because PayPal have got this position they're in now which is why they're so expensive where they have to broker and police what happens in their currency because that's what people now expect of them, it's what's written into the terms and conditions with their 100 million users and it's why they have to charge people for every part of the transactional process. Imagine instead if what we're talking about in the future is not a system or a platform or one financial institution or a million but a totally different way of doing money. Do you remember at the beginning I sort of tried to convince you that all cash was, 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 a, was a sort of confidence trick? Um, imagine if we found something else, something virtual, that had the same power that you were prepared to accept payment for goods and services with and that I was prepared to receive payment for goods and services with and we could trade with, with a fixed, a fixed or at least a globally relevant value. So kind of like a, a, a digital single currency. Um, 
Now, this has been tried many times um, on, a, on a, a slightly less than global level. What's really interesting is somebody who knew a lot more than I do about economics, um, Keynes, advocated the use of a single currency. And he said, and this, ne this nearly became law in 1945, uh, sorry, 46. He said, the only way in which the world will manage to sustain true global trade in the era of true globalization is with a single global currency. And back then, he called it the Bancor. And there have been various attempts since. The difference we now have and the opportunity we now have is the vast number of people in the world who constitute an enormous market of as yet unserviced financial products and services. A lot of these guys are getting mobiles. A lot of those mobiles are web connected. And we can do finance with these people in a very, very different way to the way we've had to do it before. And the opportunity exists not just to create a global single digital currency, that people can move money in and out of and exchange with each other virtually without incurring fees. But once you have people using that digital currency and sending money to each other and managing assets and having liquidity in that system, you can start to do all sorts of unthinkable things. You can start to offer peer-to-peer -peer loans. You could give somebody in the West the option to make a microfinance investment via their mobile using this digital single currency, which doesn't cost the recipient anything other than the profit that investor is making on their investment. And we've got platforms like Kiva, which are microfinance platforms using dollar because there isn't yet a global digital single currency that would fit perfectly into that world. So, so what we're proposing um, is, is uh, to start very small, in fact, um, after all that sort of big um, hullabaloo. And, uh, and our interest is in the bit that I think most of these high for lawn experiments have forgotten to do, which is to get customers, get people actually using their system. Um, and based on the belief that we can create something that is better, more convenient, more pleasurable to use than the majority of credit cards, mobile banking systems, even things like Pingit, we're releasing a UK mobile payments platform called Settle in April this year. We're doing it just in Birmingham um, for lots of different complex um, reasons. And uh, we're going to launch it in Birmingham with a, a very large press coverage so that we can get a real case study of how people might use a digital virtual currency in the real world. Um, our overall ambition, however, is to start to offer truly alternative financial products in our market, whether that's Birmingham only or UK or global, um, with, uh, where we offer the, uh, the technology layer that allows transactions to be managed securely and nothing else. And, uh, and that's all I've got to say about the matter. Um, I'm very interested to know your thoughts on what might stop this happening. And I'm delighted to invite anyone interested in what we're doing to sign up for our beta trial. That, was, that felt all a little bit intense and insane um, and rather rambling, um, but at least it was on time. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's first outing, and I'm going to refine the pitch a lot more having just done that last 15 minutes. But thank you for listening, and I'm, I'm very interested in your questions. <laughs> Um, hi, I over here. Hi, sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, I enjoyed your talk. I was wondering if you would give us uh, uh, one sentence on what your uh, digital currency thing actually is. Is it like Bitcoin or? or what? So, so Bitcoin's lovely because it's a great thought experiment, but ultimately uh, slightly flawed because um, there's no kind of money in, money out to it. It kind of reliant upon the appreciation of value because of scarcity. If you're not familiar with Bitcoin, it's it's a fascinating example of a, of a very unusual tech startup. What Settle actually is, is it's mobile money. It's an app that lets you store money on your mobile and make payments, either to friends, online, or in stores. Um, so it's like, uh, it's like if you could get your Oyster card out and use it to pay for anything, not just tube fares and transfer, but transfer money to other people as well. So is it actually work with Sterling then? So at the moment, what will happen is um, uh, you, will, you will push Sterling into it. So you'll top up your account with, um, with, with Sterling. Yeah, so there'll be no fees for doing that, no fees for moving it around inside it. Obviously, um, what then the next phase is that when you're paid in Settle Credits, that rather than drawing it back out again, you would choose to put it in your account and look for somebody else that you could use it with. At a certain point, when the liquidity of the economy gets to a certain stage, which we're still calculating, we will effectively, th that money in, money out will become redundant because nobody will need to put money in or money out because there'll be plenty of liquidity flowing around the system in the first place. So at the moment, yeah, at the moment to the average Joe, it's you top it up using money, you then have a balance which just doesn't have a currency symbol by it, and then you can push that balance to whoever you want in exchange for goods and services. Does that answer your question? Yes, I was just kind of thinking how it worked when you had like 
you know, different currencies, and whether it was a currency in itself or whether it was just denominated in sterling. So at some point we will decouple it from, it will cease to be a sort of one-to-one -one fiat currency with the sterling and it will, will decouple it, but it actually won't be us decoupling it, it will be our users that start to say actually, um, this is the price that I'm going to prepare to sell my product at in settle as opposed to in dollar. And the more you go into places like Morocco, the more you realise there were already two currencies in operation with different, different preferences attached to them. It was similar to that one, actually. Yeah. It was how it interacts with other currencies. And you just mentioned um, the point at which it's decoupled, which I suppose is an extension of that point. When you, you talked about the monetary easing as a sort of false creation of money. You just suddenly create 70 billion pounds and pump it in. Yeah. And, it, and it's a sort of fairly nebulous concept. But yeah. do you have to face that same point where you go, right, that's how many settled there are, and that's it? Interesting question. Um, I don't know is the honest answer to that. Um, what we won't get involved with is, is quantitative easing effectively or issuing stipends or anything like this. Um, uh, the, the, the currency, the Linden dollar, which um, is probably the most successful example of a, of a digital currency, although it has a very closed environment to it, um, which, which at one point had, uh, had um, stock exchange trackable variation attached to it. Um, they issued stipends to all users on a regular basis to try and control the amount of liquidity in that economy. Now, that was fine because the goods that were being exchanged for it were inherent, inherently valueless. Um, we've got to be very respectful of the, of the fact that people, that inflation and deflation are both bad news for, for currencies. So we have to make sure that we are we're very, very sensible about what we allow it to do. Um, the short answer is I have no idea. Maybe we'll manage to get all $70 trillion worth of global finance into our system, um, which will render us completely broke because we'll not be able to do anything with all this money we've got. Um, maybe it'll have to be pegged at a certain point. Very early days on the economic strategy, okay, you thanks. may have gathered. <laughs> Uh, gentleman here, sorry, you had a hand up a second ago. Well, I was just going to ask, at this stage, a mm. new a new client coming onto your platform yeah. would still need a bank account. To Correct, pay. absolutely. And the the um, well, the seller, the vendor, the yeah. merchant, yeah. actually, would still need a bank account. Well, they wouldn't if they... To, to cash it in. It, let's, yeah. let's say you walked for the first time into a city like Birmingham where everyone was using it, you wouldn't necessarily need a bank account, you just need a mobile phone. You need an account with us because people could pay you money in it and you could pay out in it. Just like if you're a merchant coming into a city, you could receive money and pay out in it. Um, the interesting bit very soon is going to be connecting it to places like M-Pesa. Um, so at the moment, M-Pesa have an office in London where you can go and you can, you can top up someone else's M-Pesa account. Let's say a lot of, it's, a lot of this is for sort of friends, friends back home, family, family back home. Um, we want to be able to offer people the opportunity to push money from Settle into M-Pesa. Um, and what that offers us is um, something that M-Pesa doesn't have in this country, which is large amounts of Western liquidity. Um, we'll be able to offer people investment opportunities, microloan products, directly into that, into that network of, of account holders, if you like. Uh, and we will partner with other people who are doing mobile payment stuff as well and incentivize the use of mobile payments over traditional banking. And presumably you can use the data, data of the transactions to gauge for instance, their credit rating. That's Absolutely. So, so um, it's all about data management, and the clever tech stuff is all about database management, obviously. But from our data, we get our business value, we get our security, our, you know, our detection systems are going to be much more um, useful to us from a security point of view than hacking, than sort of firewalls and, and robust login procedures. You know, it's the, it's the fraud detection that's going to be most valuable. And yes, absolutely, we can use completely different ways to assess whether this person really exists, whether they're reliable, whether they should be loaned money, and therefore cutting out the massive expense that goes with delivering a banking service to a remote part of Kenya, for example. Yes? Um, so I, I have um, sort of two questions, mm. which perhaps you can, I'll, I'll ask them both and then you can answer both. Go on. Um, so the, the, first, the first question is, um, suppose that you did manage to get a large number of people to use your, your virtual currency. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you think that uh, regulators in the Bank of England would react yeah. when their monetary policy stops wow. working? <laughs> um, <laughs> and the, second the, question, sorry, you The second question too. is, um, it's supposed that you were that big and you, you don't do any quantitative easing and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, effectively, you say that monetary policy in your new currency would be to do nothing, <laughs> in which case, um, how would you react if, if people lost all their their worth through an economic shock in right. your currency? Um, so um, the first question, 
Um, we are obviously very well aware of the FSA who exists to kind of make things difficult for ideas like this. And um, what's really interesting is that, um, well, we, we've got, I have to say, wonderful legal support from, from um, a law firm called Cobbitz. I don't know if you have them in London, we have them up in Birmingham. Um, and uh, we have, uh, in addition to that, some great, uh, we have the chief, the chief technology officer of a, a major global bank as our security consult. We have the head of .com for Tesco's as our retail consult. We have some big players helping us navigate the space. On the specific issue of FSA, um, uh, with our on our, on our law lawyer's advice, we have told them what we're doing, and we've told them that we're flying under the radar. And the reason we're flying under the radar is that we're operating in a geographically restricted area, and we have direct relationships with all the merchants that are offering um, receipt of payment in this currency. So actually, we behave as FSA terms, um, no different to a shopping mall gift card that you can buy. Um, yeah, you can send it to anyone else in the world, but they can only use it in that shopping mall. And uh, what we'll do with that data is we will use that as our, as our real world business model. So that when we go for finance, we're not some sort of bleary eyed, mad bunch of startups. We've actually got a profitable operation business with some key answers, some key assumptions played out in reality. The second question, um, that is a very, very good question. At the moment, our risk analysis has gone as far as launching in Birmingham and using it as a quick, convenient means of payment. Um, and it hasn't gone any further than that at the moment. So this talk, um, because I didn't want to talk just about the product, is very, very far-fetched. It's very, very likely that if we don't get shot, um, we'll get bought and shut down. That happened to Mondex, uh, a pre-mobile business that launched in Swindon on a very similar proposition, um, bought by MasterCard, shut down. And there's lots of different avenues for it to go in, but one of the things we're looking for at the moment is a proper economist, because you can tell that I am winging this conversation um, and well out of my depth. So that is one of the things that we want to bring on board um, in the next six months. Um, gentlemen at the back. Um, I'm just wondering if you have a view on how you'll control speculation on the currency as it starts to grow, and if you're going to control speculation too much, how are you going to promote liquidity in the market? which the, well, the banks will create by speculating on currency and by making those sort of trades that will become a serious regulatory headache yeah. going down the line. Uh, that, that is a, a technical question that I won't even try and answer, and that's again why, why we need a proper grown-up economist to, to join us. Um, what I will say on that note, though, is that we are 100% on, on the side of our users. So what we will be doing in that respect is whatever is in the best interest of our ordinary people users. Those are the guys that we get out of bed in the morning to make life easier for, whether they are in the West and want to know how much money they spent on fags and booze, or in a developing country and want to be able to trade without so much ridiculous expense. I mean, microfinance alone typically costs 10 times what it costs borrowers in, in, in the UK just to borrow tiny amounts of money. So we will always do what's in the best interest of our users. Um, and we're not interested even in, in the merchants by that comparison. So I'm sorry I can't answer your question. Better to do the John Lewis thing rather than wing something complex like that. Um, yes. Hi, Stefan. So, so who's your target market really for this product initially? Brummies. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so those, those, these people in Birmingham. Yeah. They, um, I mean, what's in it for the Tesco or the retailer? Why would they do this? So that's a, that's a really good question. And um, the, the answer to that comes in what our short to medium term monetization strategy is. And that's around marketing. Um, unless you are, well, Tesco is a bad example that proves the point because they do have club card. They do know where, pe where people use their money if they elect to use their loyalty card at the same time. But there exists no database in the world that allows you to see where people really spend their money and market to people based upon where they actually spend their cash, not where they aspirationally say they want to. And what we will do is, well, we'll never give away anyone's, not even their first name to a merchandise or a marketer. But we will allow them, our merchants, to participate in our marketing scheme, which is tokenized marketing. They can send messages to the users in the app, so it could be used for simple loyalty cards or on spot promotions. But you will, if you're a coffee shop in be able to use our marketing system to segment and target people who bought coffee, but also own in buying um, extreme sportswear so that you can sell them your new Machu Picchu mountain coffee or something like that and thus giving a very, very unique way to um, small merchants. Maybe it's interesting to Tesco's as well, but, but, but I'm thinking mainly independent traders to segment and target and deliver relevant, timely, appropriate, targeted marketing correspondence to their users. People use Voucher Cloud now. They like discounts and offers, but they get far too much spam. So something in the middle, which incentivizes merchants to be relevant and targeted, um, is what we're going to offer them. OK. <laughs> but, but I, I mean, there's another advantage. 
Atlantic to Tesco, presumably they pay thousands and thousands, well, millions of pounds to the to the to the likes of the banks and, yeah. and Visa and Mastercard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to the extent that they can use your your system um, free, yeah. I, I presume. Yeah. Um, you know, th that's a business case for them. That absolutely. Them. Yeah. So, so we're charging merchants on money out. Um, there are no charges for anything else in the system except money out. So what we're actually doing is we're taking a hit on cash in, debit card fees and that sort of stuff, for people to top up their accounts, and we're charging 2% for money out. And 2% is probably actually more than Tesco's pay at the moment, but it's not more than the majority of merchants pay. It's certainly that the, the credit card rental processing fees exclude a load of merchants from even taking credit cards in the first place. So that cost advantage, if all they're going to do is use it and then draw it straight out again, um, obviously, our biggest target at the moment in our Birmingham campaign is Birmingham City Council, because everyone in Birmingham has to pay Birmingham City Council something. Um, and if we get them to accept payment and settle, Bristol Council are accepting payments for council tax in the Bristol Pound that launches in May. Um, they're both um, nefariously left-wing Liberal Democrat councils. Um, then we will have a way of saying to merchants, actually, you can make your transactional processing completely free. Yes, last one, I think, otherwise you're going to get really upset with me taking lots of questions sorry, sorry. I'm just curious as to who you think your your biggest competitors or where do you think the biggest competition is going to come yeah. from because there's you know the rumor of Facebook credits and how that's going to take off yeah. and also you know I'm sure your ears close to the ground that um, major UK mobile phone operators are coming together to do mobile gifting platform and yeah, various yeah. other aspects of that to collect exactly that type of data yeah as to where people are spending their money. Yeah, that's a very valid point. And um, the, the truth is, of course, we have competitors from all those fields and many more, and the people that I've put up on here and all the stuff that's cooking along that we don't yet know about. Um, in truth, most of what they're doing um, is about credit cards on your phone or mobile banking on your phone. Um, even things like Google Wallet are just digitizing, funnily enough, Citibank credit card details, putting them on a mobile phone so you can use near field communication to make a payment. And um, that's a little bit too entrenched in the existing system for us. And there are things we can do by completely bucking the system that they can't do ever. They're still constrained, for example, on statement analysis. You're still not going to get more than 60 characters on your bank statement. You're still not going to be able, at the moment, to digitally analyze as you go where all your money's gone, what proportion of your income's gone on leisure or anything like this. So live real-time data on your financial position is something we can offer our users that they can't do. Um, I think that on the issue of mobile phone networks, um, uh, I, I'm, uh, there's, there's lots of things going on in the mobile phone space at the moment, which is really interesting. Um, however, mobile networks have totally cocked up SMS. They have lost millions, tens of millions of pounds of revenue through people, through people using um, short messaging services that are essentially mi mixed in with all the data that goes along the networks. So I think they've actually got quite a lot of bigger problems to deal with at the moment. And their problems are about long-term sustainability of their business model. They can no longer charge for uh, call time or for uh, text messages, which five years ago were, were all they charged for. So my expectation around that is that actually mobile networks will have to give up trying to price commoditization of their networks, and they'll have to just work on um, monetizing subscription revenues for data packages. And that's great because we can slip our stuff into any data transaction that, that a mobile phone can, can manage. So I think they are a little bit, I don't think they're going to they're gonna have the, 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 the business focus or the orientation to really hit this space with the effort they need. To, to move on. There are competitors directly to us that allow you to add stuff to your mobile phone bill. Um, and that, that's actually a really interesting space that I've got my eye very closely on. I think that, that ability to just get everything on one bill at the end of the month is, is, is quite attractive to the consumer. So that's maybe the stealth customer within mobile. OK, thanks very get much. Get off, yeah. <laughs> one, one, no, one quick question. Are you yeah. staying for a little while so people can mob you? Of course. Good. Uh, founder of um, Betfair, gun to his head within six months. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan. No Thanks. problem. Thank Thanks you. <laughs>